Welcome back to chapter 5. In this second lecture video, we're mostly just going to show the examples that will each have their own um, fully worked example videos and comment on a couple of additional concepts involving friction. But really what we're going to see is that these problems will look extremely similar to chapter 4. There's just that extra step of having to solve for the normal force. So in this very first example that will get its own video, this reminds us that if we look at the bold text here, a two kilogram block is sliding without any additional push or pull force on an incline where coefficient of friction mu k equals 0.3. Find the acceleration down the incline. The key thing about these problems is nowhere in that bolded text do we use the phrase normal force. The key thing is once we start to see that coefficient of friction show up, we have to recognize that that means we are solving for friction based on those tools that we introduced in the previous lecture video. So we'll see that in action in its own example video. This second example is one that trips up a lot of students when problems like it show, show up. It's one of the best ways we have to kind of see if we're still remembering that we have previous knowledge that we can build on. In this case here, we have a bale of hay traveling at 15 meters per second sliding on a surface where mu k equals 0.3. We want to find the distance the bale slides before stopping. First of all, the most common thing I see students do is either use that 15 as a push force or decide that there is a push force that is just unknown. No one is currently pushing on this bale of hay. They did before the problem started in much the same way that when we start to look at a car that's already driving 70 miles an hour down the highway, we don't care that at some point previously it was in someone's garage. So when we start to look at this bale of hay, it is already moving. We just watch it slide past and we're like, where did that come from? But the key thing is that when this question asks about the distance before stopping, that should look like a chapter two problem to us. Chapter two problems mean that we need acceleration, but we know from our work in chapter four that acceleration comes from net forces. So this is one of many problems that we'll come across where we combine force ideas with kinematics ideas. We will see its own fully worked example, but I do want to indicate here that we have a um, force diagram showing the only three forces that are acting on this bale of hay. And next to it, we have the arrows that are very familiar to us from chapter two. The fact that motion is in one direction, but the net force, the acceleration, is in an opposite direction. That's okay, we've seen that before. So we'll see that in its own example video. This third example, there's nothing especially new and different about it, except for the fact that it has multiple layers of our uh, complications that we've seen. It's got inclines, it got forces at angles, and it's got friction involved. So we'll see how we can easily handle, if we have been building our problem solving process, we can easily handle this problem just going one step at a time using that list of um, complications and how to deal with those complications. This fourth example, this is one where we wanna make sure we really do understand the idea of starting a block moving meaning that we're looking for that maximum static for, uh, friction force. So we'll see this example, um, and we'll see very similar examples to it in homeworks and tests. But that's one thing that we want to recognize is that can be wording that is a little bit tricky to think about until we understand why that wording exists. The static friction value can be nothing if we don't need it to be. Um, but if we're pulling up the ramp, that friction is trying to prevent our motion, it will be pointing down the ramp. So we will see this example in its own lecture video or its own example video as well. Now, something to consider. If we have an incline, that can actually help us calculate 
the coefficient of static friction. We had that list of common materials in our textbook, but those numbers had to be figured out somehow. We can do that by figuring out that breaking point of static friction. So for example, if we bring back our handy um, turtle plus uh, cutting board idea, if the cutting board is flat, then the only forces acting on this turtle are gravity down and the normal force from the cutting board surface straight up. As I start to tilt the cutting board, however, gravity is still straight down, the normal force is perpendicular to the surface, and now friction has to fight against the, co the component of gravity that is trying to pull this thing downhill. So in a situation like this, there is now an amount of static friction force that is uphill. And as we tilt this more and more, at some point, at some angle, and I've chosen the cutting board because this has a lot of grooves in it, it's not very smooth, but at some angle, poor little guy, at some angle, it will start to slide. And it's basically, if we start to plug numbers in except for the unknown angle, and we're not going to spend time um, doing that either in this lecture video or in a um, example problem, but you can prove it to yourself. We can see what that angle looks like, and that will tell us what the coefficient of um, static friction will be. If we look at the y force equation and the x force equation, we will be able to um, calculate that. So all of the friction examples presented in this lecture video have had one mass. One thing that we haven't done yet is a friction problem that has objects tied together. We'll see those in upcoming assignments. And I want us to recognize that there's, there's no new tricks to show us. We have seen how to deal with friction when um, we have a coefficient. We find the normal force, then we find the amount of friction so that we can use it. That's going to be true too. We know how to handle multiple objects, separate force equations, separate free body diagrams. And so in that case, we'd have to solve for the normal force of each object and go from there. So we will see that in upcoming assignments. And the key idea out of chapters four and five together is that we want to practice the process we go through enough, those are the tools that we're building, that we should be able to feel confident to handle any combination of complications from the list that we've made for ourselves. So before we wrap up section 5.1, I do want to go through um, one example of friction when there are multiple objects. Now, we absolutely have the ability to apply our tools to this problem. It is not a question of whether this is outside the abilities of our um, Physics 125 skills, but there is slightly more math and slightly more setup without additional physics understanding. So in much the same way that we've commented a couple of times this semester so far on places where we have the ability to solve problems, but they aren't good choices for tests or quizzes, this is the same kind of thing here. I would highly recommend that you try this problem if you really want to kind of push yourself and make sure that you're understanding all of this. Three separate objects means we have three separate unknowns. And two separate ropes means we have two separate tensions. So the solution is on um, the slide uh, coming up. But to point out where to get started, if we look at these um, objects, the five kilogram block is big enough that it's going to pull the entire system so that it rotates, um, in this case, counterclockwise. The five kilogram block on the left will move downwards. The four kilogram block on the top of this table will move to the left and the two kilogram block will move upwards. We need to set that direction of motion, the direction of acceleration to be positive. 
Then we set up a force diagram and free body diagram for each separate object. And so you are welcome to try it on your own and then compare here. But there's even a note on our um, work that we've put on this slide that it's okay to really kind of ensure we understand how to deal with multiple objects. But it's not a great test question because there's more setup without really more physics. So to finish up, this is our summary of what we have learned in chapter four and five so far. Newton's three laws of motion. And now we have added for section 5.1 and for our main problem type to come out of chapter five, the idea of what static friction is and what kinetic friction is. And this reminder that when it says moving, we mean moving across a surface not just the object itself, because people walking would not be kinetic friction because they aren't sliding across that surface. So we'll see plenty of examples in the videos that I indicated for the examples that we saw so far, as well as the practice set online, and then you'll get a chance to try all of this in the problem sets. The last thing that we have um, in this chapter is an understanding of what um, we mean by drag force in a concept kind of way, and then getting into a little bit of the um, equations behind springs and the spring force, which will come back again in chapter seven. So I will see you in that next video.